Discord has posted a new blog a few days ago about a very interesting problem they ran into how they store trillions of their messages if you don't know discord is this client messaging app that has become really popular especially in the live streaming i think a space where most of the gaming and live streamers use discord as their you know de facto communication channel so for chatting or audio calls and i've seen sometimes i watch youtube podcasts that use discord as calls uh, to receive calls so they have discussions there so it's a very popular app and uh, i think 2017 uh, i covered how they moved from mongodb as their primary storage to cassandra and it was a very interesting blog that they wrote back then and just a few days ago they wrote another blog how they storing trillions of messages they move from billions now to trillions and they are moving essentially from cassandra as their main uh, storage engine and database to CellaDB. in this blog what i want to go go through is i want to go through the the sections that they talk about they talk about the problems of cassandra they talk about the challenges they face they talk about many other things and then they talk about what they did to solve these problems uh, and migrate everything from cassandra to cella db so let's analyze this let's get started how discord stores trillions of messages in 2017 we wrote a blog post on how we store billions of messages I talked about that. I'm going to reference the video below and the podcast as well for those listening. We shared our journey of how we started out with using MongoDB, but migrated our data to Cassandra because we were looking for a database that was scalable, fault tolerant, and relatively low maintenance. So those are the things they were looking at. The reason they didn't start with a relational database is they wanted a distributed database to start with scalable that's the word they used i want to talk about this a little bit as relational databases while you can shard them you can definitely partition relational data into multiple instances it is commonly the case where that is causes you more problems the reason is simple reasons just transaction you can't do transactions across shard effectively right because transactions are by design the multi-version concurrency control aspects of it and acidity and all these nice properties are just at the instance level it can't just sp spread them now i know people will yell at me yeah you can two-phase command three-phase command and Maxos, Maxos, of course, there's always a way, but as at its simplicity and we add so predictability as a single instance, the, all the data is in one instance. Now, that doesn't mean you, you have to use one instance for relational database. You can scale horizontally by having replication, you know, have one master writer that receives writes and then have many read replicas and as uh, the master node receives writes the wall changes or the transaction log changes will be pushed down to the replicas and the replicas will have the essentially eventual consistency so sort of speak and they will catch up so that's the state of the art that we have it and you can go further than that and shard if you want by actually splitting the data into multiple databases in that model in the original model everything is in those replicas all the data is there and there is no oh this database has only half of the data and this database has the other half no if you want you can shard that by partitioning and put the data based on a certain sharding key and if you hit that sharding key you hit that instance and you read the data that you want right mongodb by default 
and Cassandra and Scylla, they start with that model, that sharding model, where things are partitioned, things are full tolerant, things are scalable, right? as they call it. And this way you have the database that knows will have fewer and fewer data. As a result, your queries are faster when you, when you hit that. The reason is, as I always say, the goal of all these queries is to work with as few fewer data as possible. That's the goal. Yeah. Instead of searching trillions, right, you search sub millions. That and of course, if you work with fewer data and you have be beautiful indexes, you can even further reduce that result set into exactly what you want. That, that that's the whole trick behind databases. Right? Work with as fewer data as possible. How do you get there? Indexes, partitioning, sharding, all these tricks. So MongoDB Cassandra does that by default. You have a partition key and the base on the partition key you hit the node and that node has the data and the node of course uh, this becomes of course dangerous right just one node have part of the data what if that node dies that's why you have a quorum of this data should be duplicated in multiple nodes usually three and of course uh, that's basically the the state of the art as we have it all right with that said we wanted the database to grow alongside us but hopefully its maintenance needs wouldn't grow uh alongside our storage needs unfortunately we found that that not to be the case our cassandra cluster exhibited serious performance issues that required increasing amounts of effort to just maintain not to prove to not improve right so let's unpack that we store our messages in a database called cassandra messages this is their database that stores all the messages. In 2017, we ran 12 Cassandra nodes storing billions of messages. That's when we discussed this article back then, right? At the beginning of 22, we had 177 nodes. So they increased a lot, right? To store trillions of messages. Now, trillions, we're talking about multi billion, no, multi thousand billions, right? That's nuts. To our chagrin, is this even a word? What the heck is chagrin? Distress. Okay, I, I never knew that word. To our stress, it was a high toil system. Our on-call team was frequently paged for issues with the database. Latency was unpredictable, and we were having to cut down maintenance operation that become too expensive. Why? Why is latency unpredictable? Well, let's take a look. There is a SQL statement here cql statement that has been chopped i think by by the safari reader so i'm gonna show it here instead and then go back there i prefer that view is better but here we're looking at the messages table their message table includes the channel id which is a unique identifier for the channel and the server uh, bucket a bucket is literally an integer that represents uh, a time window very critical to let you know that this message lived in this time window because you're going to have a lot of messages in the same time window and you want them next to each other usually right especially if they are belong to the same channel why if you do a read to read certain message at a certain time most probably you want to read those messages that are came after and before it right unless it's like direct messages that should be in a different system right but if it's a public channel and that ch i mean just a channel messages from that channel should live together why especially in time because a read if i do an io and that's true for both b3s or lsm that cassandra uses or sell id before that matter you want to do an io and you want to get as much as you, uh, from your io as possible right you don't want to do multiple ios to read 10 messages you want to do do a single io and get a thousand messages twenty thousand messages if possible just all compactly nice into a single page that's the goal of databases if you manage to do that you won right and that's what they are doing they're doing it the, the data modeling is beautiful here right? and they have also a message id which we're going to talk about 
in a minute that this ID, this is a unique identifier that, that identify this message and the author and the content of the message. And notice that the primary key is on the channel ID sorted by the bucket and then the message ID. All of three are all of the three are the unique primary key, which is then defines the clustering of that table. And the clustering is very critical because that's how the data is stored on disk based on this ordering, the channel pack bucket and message ID. Sweet. All right. Uh, now we can go back to the to the better view here. So the SQL CQL, the Cassandra query language statement above, is a minimal version of our message schema. Every ID we use is a snowflake. All the sequences is not... It's just so it's all just monotonically increasing. They, you don't you didn't get a lot with it. You don't do much with it. You want more data in your messages, so like, such as time and other information, right? And that's what a snowflake gives you here. So what do they do with the snowflake? Why don't we just use UUIDs, GUIDs, right? GUIDs are unique, which is nice, but they are random. Random is not good in storage because if you generate random messages they have no relation to each other and as a result the database if you cluster on that uuid it will try to sort it and the sorting does not make any sense because the thing is random so if you turn around and try to read these uuids you'll be going all over the place uh, so there is a a better version of uuid which is called the ulid uh, looks a clear <laughs> What do you pronounce that? Lexographically sorted GUEDs that is used now by Shopify, and I covered that. That it gives you like an ordered list that are unique UUIDs. Beautiful. So if you generate UUIDs that are next to each other, they are technically ordered. And if you have ordered things that are relative to each other, a query to give you one, one. UUID will give you all anything related to it also in the same page and if you do that things that are next to each other will make sense right and that's what Shopify did Shopify used this to ensure item potency in their ordering every order request will get a unique ULID and because we know that orders will be absolutely next to each other right one after the other right they are storing these orders on this request and if they want to check if the ulid is a duplicate if the order is a duplicate they just read that and guess what they're gonna always hit that neat tail page where where all the uuids must live and this page will be cached right it's almost impossible that you're gonna hit a request order that is has been submitted uh three days ago right because orders to check duplicates you only check within a few seconds or even minutes right and those will be guaranteed to be next to each other and that's the beauty here so they're using something similar here they, they are trying to cluster they're trying to group things together we partition our messages by channel they are sent in so that's the first key they use to partition along with the bucket which is a static time window this partitioning means that in cassandra all messages for a given channel and bucket bucket will be stored together and replicated across three nodes. This is the quorum, right? The replication factor. Every every message within the same channel and bucket, if you send a lot of messages in the same time window, all of these nice messages will go to the same nodes effectively, right? Within this partitioning lies a potential performance for pitfall. A server with just a small groups of friends tend to send orders of magnitudes fewer messages, of course, than a server with hundreds of thousands of people. And in and th and the same time, same channel, right? In the same channel, same group of time, you will get a burst of massive amount of messages on, from one server compared to another. So you'll see these, uh, they call hotspots, like one bucket of time, especially like maybe at night-ish, right? You would see this flood of 
queries into these areas and writes, right? And if this happens, this will create this hotspot. So why is this a problem? Let's continue reading. In Cassandra, reads are more expensive than writes. So in order to talk about this, we need to understand uh, the difference between uh, what Cassandra uses, which is a log structured merge tree versus uh, which most all relational databases use, which is B plus trees. B plus trees are data structure that is used to index your table and they can also be used to store the raw data as well, sorted into what we call leaf pages. So each page will have based on your primary key, I'm assuming a clustered index primary key here, all your primary key and of the full row will be stored in these pages ordered. So row number one and all its columns, row number two, all its column three, all of all its column, right? And it's going to be ordered until the fixed page is full. And that becomes one leaf page and then followed by the next one. And these leaf pages are linked and changed together so you can traverse back and forth between the list pages. Then you have the root node, an intermediate node that is allowed to be used to index, to quickly go to the page which has the row you're looking for. Right? Very simple. If you're looking for row number 55, you'll start with the root node and the root node will tell you oh if you want row 0 to 10 go to this page from 11 to 20 go to this page and so on so 55 is between this and this you hit that page and then you do in the internal node you do the same thing until you hit the leaf page that you want that's how b plus three works in a nutshell and in in an unclustered indexes the leaf pages will not have actual data they will have simple pointers to the actual table like in postgres it's the tuple id which is a page id and the index of the tuple but in pri in a, in a mysql or other databases it's a pointer to the primary key it's actual the primary key value right? in and, and how do you do an insert very simple you want to insert a row you need to find which page that row needs to go in in that index and then insert it right into that page and you're, you'll update it in memory of course that leaf page right if there's hopefully there's a space in your page and you're going to write it right there in the correct order so let's say the values are one two seven right and then you want to insert the value of three three has to be right after the two and right before the seven you have to order them as you insert the order is critical right because it's clustered indexes are at the end of the day they are they have to be ordered and when you do that you also use a persistent model such as the write ahead log or the commit log they call it transaction log to persist these changes only into that and then you commit that it's enough to commit just that you don't have to flush the page to disk right but eventually you will have to in b plus three if you flush the page it's an update it's an actual physical update to the os he says hey this page go and update it and what does that mean well the page is a fixed size it lives on disk on a file and it lives really in a particular offset and it ends at a particular offset. So you would issue a write and say, hey, write this content, this new content on position number 2000 for eight kilobytes. That's like an example of a fixed page, right? Or 16K in case of MySQL. And that's an update. So what's wrong with updates? Updates are like in-place updates. In the days of hard drives, this is an actual in place. So you, when you do that, the hard drive will seek in and will find the location sector and then write it back, overwrite whatever you had. In SSDs, unfortunately, there is no thing as called in place update. You don't you don't just overwrite things. Unfortunately, that's because of all the NAND, the way NAND works, NAND cells. You invalidate. 
to write something to the SSD, to update something to the SSD, you know the logical block address, right? Which is basically what maps the file system offset down to an array, if you will, a list of logical block address. And those will be flushed to disk, right? This is what I want to update. That will translate into whatever technology in the driver, whether this is NVMe or normal SATA stuff. So yeah, in SSDs though, when you do an update, do you want to update a certain LBA? What happens is you can't overwrite existing things. So what the SSD controller does is actually takes your write, right? Write it to a new place, finds a new block and a, a list of pages where this fits, and then writes your data. The second step is it invalidates the old data. That's what it does. It says, hey, this is no longer valid there. So that's another write. So one write, two writes, one write to actually write the thing, the second write to invalidate it. And the third one is an in-memory DRAM change, which now points your logical block address in the OS that the OS uses down to the new physical location. That's what we change in the SSD. We change the pointer. The pointer is now this. This is your new pointer. This way, the OS can continue working with the same LBA, the logical block address, but the physical block continues to change. And that's what happens. Every time you update, it moves to a new place. It moves to a new place, a new place. This is a disaster if you keep doing it a lot. Why? Because now you're left with stale, invalid pages. Eventually, if you do it a lot, then you will fill up your SSD very quickly with the invalid data. Right? Especially if you update a lot of stuff. So you'll have active and invalid, active and invalid. So now what happens? This invalid data to be used, it has to be cleared. And guess what? To be cleared, the whole erasable unit has to be erased to be written to. You can't just use it. And that in itself is an expensive operation called the garbage collection. So as you want, all of a sudden you want to do a new update or new write, you have no place. So the controller will say, wait a minute, let me find an, a, 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 a stale block, erase it, that's one write, and write your stuff to it. So that's, you're going to do two IO in this case. Not bad, right? But here's where it goes really bad. When you have an erasable unit, and I know I, I'm going all over the place, but it's all related, guys. Believe me, it's all related. That's why we do these deep dives. Like, well, if you're going to do like a summary, why, why would we be here even, right? Let's talk seriously about these things. Um, and if we have this erasable unit, and if it has mixed valid data and invalid data, this is where it gets really bad. Because now I can't just erase it. It has valid data. So the uh, controller has to garbage collect. And this garbage collector has nothing to do with Java or Cassandra's jar garbage collector. has nothing to do. This is the SSD jar garbage collector. The garbage collector. Keep uh, stumbling by my words there. So now the garbage collector has to move the valid data to a new block. That's one I.O. It has to erase the block, a second I.O. It has to write three I.O.s. Your uh, write throughput, and as they call it, the write amplification, is tremendously increased. Your one I.O. that you think it's a single update, it's now four updates, four, four I.O.s, which now, of course, this takes... Uh, space from uh, first of all it takes bandwidth the io is now being used for things that you didn't really it's not your things it's the system things and then you also need a space to store this temporary data right that's the over provisioning so that's kind of quick lesson on ssds and how updates are really 
not quite good on the long run. That's why B plus trees and SSDs, especially like if you have like page splits, this become exacerbated. And as you grow the tree, the tree splits and pages splits and all of these splits are just updates, right? Uh, it's like more writes and updates and deletes and updates. So like that's where things go really bad when it comes to SSD. And, and when I say really bad, you're talking about years until this can, you, you see the difference, you know? So people invented this concept of log structured merge trees or, or uh, LSM, uh, which is Cassandra, which Cassandra is used by default and CellaDB, right? And now what, what the main goal of SS, uh, the LSM is everything is a write immutable. You rarely do an update. You're going to do an update, but very rare. It's called a step called compaction, right? So always write in memory, write to the commit log, write to this transaction log as you do changes. Everything is a write, 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 write. And as you're in memory, the mem table is filled up. You flush the mem table to disk as a called the no, you don't flush it directly. You sort it, and then you flush it as as a table. And this is called the sorted string tables or SS tables. So you sort and flush. So when you flush, you write. You never ever update this table. Never. It's always an insert. So now this, as you create more and more and more SS tables, this first level gets filled up. So what you do is the next step, you read a bunch of these tables based on th certain criteria and write them to another larger set of tables, right? And then you do the same thing. And always everything is an insert. Everything is an insert. What this creates is now, the problem with this is, the, go the good about, let's talk about the good. The good about this is as you write, writes are extremely fast. The SSD doesn't have to do this Right, all, everything you're writing is actually your data. You're not really invalidating anything, right? Like you're always writing in a new place, which is a nice thing, especially if you're writing in sequence. Database uh, SSDs love this, right? It's, it's a very nice sequential write if you do it sequentially. But like, think about what do we do? We insert we update like actual the users do an insert and update and delete all of these will be translated to inserts all of them an insert is an insert in an ss table in an lsm an update is an insert a delete is also an insert it's called a tombstone you create a tombstone so if you <laughs> if you keep inserting and updating a message and delete uh, updating the same message updating the same message update update what you do is like you create new records effectively right and you persist them in new ss tables and ss tables so now to look for the thing you actually want reads have become very very slow because they have to first look up in the mem the mem cache in the, in the mem table and then you look up in the first layer of the SS table to look for your stuff. You go, if you didn't find it, you go to the another stable and you go to another SS table, you go to another SS table until you find what you were looking for, right? Or you found a tombstone that you know, this, this thing is actually deleted. I have to stop. Well, both Cassandra and Sela uses a technique called Bloom filters. So say, okay, uh, your record is actually, n is n it's impossible to be here. So it's like a nice bitmap that is stored that you can quickly check to use uh, to see before you actually open the SS table to check if this thing is actually there or not, right? So these are like kind of nice trick. With those explained, now that we know the benefits of LSM versus the detriments, now reads have become slow, right? So what we do with the it says uh, LSM is we do something called compaction and this is where updates and deletes happens where we can group things together and then delete the tombstones uh, delete duplicate records have one record of the same thing we don't need the old stuff anymore right remove it you have compact things so 
a thousand version of the same thing are no longer the thousand it's just one you delete this stuff and of course in that process what you do is you create a new thing and you just delete right the old stuff and you create it's always a create a new one right so a delete technically is is a marking and that lba and the ssd as deleted but it's not as you do it very is you, do, you don't do it as often as as an update to a b3 does that make sense that's that's the goal of it this is the i personally can't speak to how how bad b plus three can affect your ssds you know or lsm it's like i only hear things and i i don't believe anything i hear unless i actually see it myself you know so that's we always human beings we create we we have a problem we create a solution but that solution almost always creates other problems and that's what we have here all right with that rant <laughs> now let's jump into it again in cassandra reads are more expensive than writes writes are appended to a commit log as i talked about it and written to an in-memory structure called a mem table that is eventually flushed to disk reads however need to query the mem table to potentially and potentially multiple SS tables on disk files to find what you're looking for. So this is a more expensive operation. Lots of concurrent reads as users interact with servers can hotspot a partition. Okay. Which we refer to as Im imaginatively as a hot partition. The size of our deaths when combined with these access patterns led to struggle for our cluster. So what happens here is because most queries go to almost the same partition almost to the same uh bucket channel id will create these hot partitions like the, the node becomes so busy because all the queries will go to it and this is the same tail problem that we talked about where things that are which is a good thing when it if, if the database has a good caching you know in place it will, it will, it should, it should just serve you from the memory because these should be in memory. But because this is LSM, it has to go to disk because nothing is in memory. Can't put these SSL tables, SS tables in memory, right? They have to live in disk, apparently, right? I don't know much about LSM, but if this was B3, the page will be just right there alive for you the page will have everything there is no walking to go get multiple things it's just one thing you know you get the page and that that page will give you everything so it's actually a better design if you have these hot spots because all these hot spots will hit that cache right versus in this case you're doing more ios because you're doing ss ss tables now you might say i'm saying let's just co compact you can't compact fast enough to uh, to go with the demand because these are brand new things as they are written people want to read right because if you write new things what what the moment you write a message what do what is the first thing you're going to do other clients want to read that same message in a relational database this is the best case scenario right because you just wrote something it's hot in memory it's sure it's dirty but we're going to serve you that read off of the from the buffer pool it's right there take it we don't even need to see the disk that's the power right of the b plus trees at the, essentially here in this case right but in that case what we have i know i'm repeating myself but in this case what's happening is because we're doing this ss tables and writing to another ss tables and taking just just to save make writes fast we significantly slowed down reads and that's the main problem here when we encountered hot partition it frequently affected latency across our entire database our channel and bucket pair received large amount of traffic and the latency in the node would increase as the node tried harder and harder to serve traffic and fell further and further behind it just can't keep up one node can't keep up if all the traffic goes to one node and the node has to do io if the node is cache if it's like serving from the cache sure and even that is a lot but go doing io 
and serving and doing compaction Shh. good luck uh, so so far this is a problem with both Sela and Cassandra. This is not a unique problem for Cassandra. Since we re perform read and write with quorum consistencies, all queries to the nodes that serve the hot partition suffer latency increases, resulting in a broader end user impact. At the end of the day, users feel it. Right? Cluster maintenance tasks also frequently cause trouble. All right, so there's a maintenance operation also causes some more trouble. We were prone to falling behind on compactions. That's the problem, right? I told you, human beings, we always introduce a solution, but the solution has problems. Compaction. When, when did we ever have to do compaction with, with B plus trees? Never, right? Where Cassandra would compact SS tables on disk for more performant reads. Not only we were... Uh, w w not only were our reads then more expensive, but we'd also see cascading latency as the node tried to come back. I talked about that a little bit, right? And here is they talk about the garbage collection of Cassandra, which is which is a valid point, right? Let's talk about that a little bit. We frequently performed an operation we called the gossip dance, where we'd take a node out of rotation and let uh, the, let it compact without taking traffic. And so they took it out of uh, rotation, so it can't receive any writes anymore. Let it compact. Right? Uh, I don't know what happened with quorum now. Like, do you add other nodes, I suppose, for the quorum? Right? Bring it back in to pick up hints from the Cassandra hinted handoff and then repeat until the compaction backlog was empty. Right, so so it can start compacting. So that's kind of a a way uh, to sp uh, speed up compaction because the compaction can't keep up. All these SS tables are just being written. We also spent a large amount of time tuning the JVM garbage collector and heap setting because GC poses would cause significant latency spikes. That's understandable. As you write to, because Cassandra is written with Java, and Java is a garbage collection language. And as you write new things to create memory entries in the heap, especially those mem large mem tables, uh, if you go out, if no, if there, if there are no pointers to this, uh, no stack pointers pointing to this heap at all, then the garbage collection wakes up and start removing all these entries all the memory the, all the unused memory right so it can be released back to the operating system yeah? and those garbage poses it has to pose because technically what is the garbage collection has to acquire a mutex i suppose i don't know much about garbage collection but i think that's what i know basic thing about that memory and operating system right has to acquire a mutex to release anything in memory and that poses as you want to allocate more memory can hit an a page that you're about to write to and that's when the poses happen a memory page that is and that's the, the garbage collection poses is what caused the uh, uh, linker d right to move from uh, java the, that's the service mesh reverse proxy to Rust. They move to Rust because they say, "Hey, we want just a a, nigh, a garbage collection flee because we want predictability, right?" So they moved away from Java and Rust, and they saw significant performance. And that so that's a, that's a valid criticism of Cassandra, and I totally understand that. The rest of the I/O stuff, I don't see how Scylla is better. Well, you can you can argue that okay. Changing our character to Scylla, well, we're going to use C++ because Scylla is written with C++ and there is no garbage collection in C++. That's nice. That's fast. But how is it better, right? How's Cassandra? How's Scylla DB better? And I don't know the answer until I actually research both of them and see how exactly they are to me maybe the compaction strategies are different maybe the there is a specific enterprise level in Sela that is 
having certain features that is not available in Cassandra. That might be the case, but it's not mentioned here. So let's continue reading. Changing our architecture. Our messages cluster wasn't only wasn't our only Cassandra database. We had several other clusters and each inhibited similar, though perhaps not as severe faults. In our previous iteration of this post, we mentioned being intrigued by CellaDB, a Cassandra compatible database written in C++. It's a its promise of better performance, faster repairs, stronger workload isolation via its shard pair core architecture. So that's an interesting thing. So the, each shard live in its own CPU core. Is that how it works? And a garbage collection free life sounded quite appealing. Although CellaDB is most definitely not a void of issues, I love that they mentioned this. Right? It's not really defensive here. It's a void it's a void of garbage collection since it's written C++ rather than Java. Right? Historically, our team had many issues with garbage collection with Cassandra from GC pauses affecting latency all the way to super long consecutive GC pauses that got so bad that an operator would manually reboot and babysit the node back to health. Wow, that is, that is really bad. If, if a node just dies because of the garbage collection can't keep up, ugh. That's really bad. I understand that, right? These issues were a huge source of an on-call toil and the root of, of many stability issues with our, our messages clusters. Okay. After experimenting with CellaDB and observing improvement and testing, we made the decision to migrate all our databases. While this decision could be a block post in itself, the short version is that by 2020, we had migrated every database but one to CellaDB. Okay, so everything they migrated except the Cassandra message, the actual core database. Why had we migrated yet? To start with, it's a big cluster with trillions of messages and nearly 200 nodes, which 177 in particular. And migration was going to be an involved effort. Additionally, we wanted to make sure our new database could be the best it could be as we worked to, to tune its performance. We will also wanted to gain more experience with Scylla in production, using its using it in anger and learning its pitfall. We also worked to improve Scylla DB performance for our use cases and our, okay, so they, they talk about that, how they are actually improving Scylla itself. Because again, Scylla by itself, you gonna if you just didn't do anything, and you just implement Scylla, I suppose you're gonna get slightly better performance, but the hotspot thing is identical. Scylla still gonna, can't compete. You can't, can, what's the word? Can't keep up with the amount of writes at the tail, oh, and all these writes are going to multiple SS tables that you will turn around and issue many reads because that's the what the clients do. Discord, what do you do? You write a bunch of messages and you turn around and read the same messages. That's how Discord works. Because you're reading at the tail, the tail is dirty. The tail is spread all over the place. It's not just in, in memory. It's in this table and this table and the table behind it right so you have to do many reads so the SLA TV so and that's what they did not mention if they just blindly replace Scylla with Cassandra that will not give them much performance that's my opinion I think but they didn't do that they actually did more work what is that And they mentioned that hot, part hot partition can still be a thing in CellaDB. And, and so we also wanted to invest in improving our system upstream of the database to help shield and facilitate better database. So they knew, right, so I take that back. They knew replacing Scylla blindly with from, from Cassandra to Scylla, they're, not, they're still going to be the same problem, right? We're still going to have this hot partition at the tail so that's not no nah, we're gonna need to change our architecture so what did they do they introduced an api i think data services serving data so now and this is an interesting thing how do you actually read they didn't we don't know much about that so let's talk about that a little bit how does discord read 
from Cassandra or Scylla. There is an API, right? Does the API has any caching whatsoever? No. What they did here is absolutely brilliant. And I absolutely love it. Let's, let's talk about it. With Cassandra, we struggled with hot partitions. And you're going to struggle with Scylla. Let's be honest, right? Even if you did Scylla, you're going to have hot partitions. The same identical problems. The same architecture at the end of the day. Right? High traffic to given partition resulted in an unbounded current concurrency, concurrency, leading to a cascading latency in which subsequent queries would continue to grow in latency because like, like it just can't keep up because that node is busy reading 700 SS tables and the read after that is just queued in and the OS will have to do the read and the OS will try as much as possible to combine these reads. And that's how the file system start to work as much as possible to combine these IOs. But it still can't keep up, keep, keep up. The bandwidth of SSD will be just, you know, completely saturated. Yeah? If we could control the amount of concurrent traffic to hot partitions, we could protect the database from being overwhelmed. How? To accomplish this task, we wrote what we refer to as data services. Nice. Intermediate, intermediary services that sit between our API monolith and our database cluster. Interesting. So now they have something called data services. They didn't have that before. What does the data service do? When writing our data service, we chose a language that we've been using more at Discord, Rust. Okay, we get it. Rust. We Everybody loves Rust, right? <laughs> the language should make it easy to write safe, concurrent code. Its library also were a great match for what we were intending to accomplish. Right? And then the concurrency here is the most important thing. They weren't building, building as an asynchronous I.O. And the language has a driver support for both Cassandra and CellaDB. Our data services sit between the API and our CellaDB clusters. They contain roughly one gRPC input per database query and intentionally contain no business logic. Good. The big feature our database services provide is request coalescing, coalescing, which is basically think of it like grouping. And that is the key here. Look at this beautiful diagram. For those listening, we're looking at the a four request or n number of requests to the same identical message, right? Or not message. Like, yeah, message ID, same message ID, same bucket, same channel. So all of these, usually they used to be four concurrent different read requests to Cassandra, right? Now they built this intermediate layer that receives all these requests and they coalesce them. So if multiple users are requesting the same row at the same time, we'll only query the database once. The first user that makes the request causes a work, worker task to spin up the service. Subsequent requests will check for the existing of that task and subscribe to it. Wow, that is a beautiful design. That's, a, that's like amazing. I like, kudos. Absolutely love it. That's pretty cool. So if they, here's my point. I wonder what happens if they did implement this with Cassandra. And I'm saying I'm not saying just don't move from Cassandra, sure, just don't move it. How much would you guys would have saved? And would Cassandra hold up? Or will the garbage collection poses will still kill us? And that's the question I couldn't answer. Right? And that's that's I, I suppose that will remain unanswered, right? Uh, I suppose, of course, now their configuration is way more optimal because they, they went all the way, right? They changed the architecture to include this intermediate layer to cache almost. Like you can use this as a cache. They didn't talk about that, I think, but you can coalesce requests so you can group and send one request. But then at the same time, you can cache results, right? This, is a, this worker task is so brilliant, this idea of a worker task, because it will be in memory and you can, as long as it's alive, that means someone has just made the request, right? Here's another example. Let's imagine a big announcement on a large server that notifies everyone, at everyone, right? 
users are going to open the app and read the message because now someone just write, writes one message 100,000 people reads the same message everyone sends the same request right so all of these requests to the same single message right how do they, they know the message? I suppose it's going to be a notification. You get the notification ID and then you send a request to get that message, right? Okay. And then now you have the message ID and now everybody's sending flood of queries. In the old system, those were 100,000 queries. In the new system, it's a, it's a single? I don't think it's going to be single. It's still going to be multiple probably, right? Previously, this might have a hot partition and on-call would potentially need to be paged to help the system recover. With our data, we're, we're able to significantly reduce traffic spikes. Yeah, it's not going to be a single one, like 100 million, because it's a, it's, a, it's a worker, right? It's a worker subscriber thing, where the first person who made the request will create this worker and then send a message while all of these queries at the same time concurrently, we're going to look up this worker and as long as the worker is executing, you're going to hook to it, right? But what happens if the worker is good response and writes? Is the worker dead? Do we cache the worker result for subsequent queries? Or do we create new workers every time the, if the time the old worker is dead, even if the same if it's the same request. The second part of the magic here, and this is truly magic, I absolutely love it, is upstream of our data services. What do you guys do? We implemented consistent hash-based routing to our data service to enable more effective coalescing. Ah, whoa, right. Because remember load balancing. <laughs> if you want to, like that's the problem, right? I didn't think about that. See, if you have like a, <laughs> if you have load balancing in place, then these data services will, you'll have multiple data services, right? Requests from different clients across the world will go to different data services. And in this particular case, you will not hit the chances you're going to hit a data service that happened to cache our coalesced requests are very low. So how do you then, this is genius. This is absolutely genius, I love it. So what they did is they took and the load balancer, and again, I didn't read this part. I just, I think I skipped the part. Now I'm just reading it for the first time. Now the load balancer, they have like a hash based to take the request and says, okay, you are going to channel X on this server you're i'm gonna hash you to this data service yeah it's gonna it's gonna create more load on this particular data service but it's good you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna hit that cache you're gonna the chances of request courses are higher brilliant just brilliant i love it the improvement help a lot but they don't solve all the problems okay oh they have more problems we're still seeing hot partition and increased latency on our cassandra cluster just not quite as frequent wait a minute C cassandra cluster i thought you moved to scylla why does it say scylla here that's so confusing just not as quite as frequent it buys us some time so that we can prepare our new optimal scylla db cluster and execute them so so that's what confused me all right so i, I take i take everything back so it seems like they they did the data service before moving to Cassandra, right? Again, as I'm reading this, I'm discovering new things again, right? I, and I apologize if I made a mistake. It's not clear because the, the graphic shows Scylla messages, yet the the way they are talking about it is they say, okay, we're, we're, we're still hitting Cassandra. Okay. All right. So the data services are hitting Cassandra and, and still they did a lot of good things. Yeah. So they improve, but still they have problems. We're still seeing hot partition and increased latency on our Cassandra, just not as quite as frequently. Nice. It buys us time so they can move. Okay, so they still saw the increased latency and hot partition even with all of this. Right? Even with request coalescing, even with hash-based grouping of the requests so they hit the same data services so they can take advantage of re this request coalescing right 
a very big migration now they're into the migration our requirements for our migration are quite straightforward we need to migrate trillions of messages with no down there and we need to do it quickly because while the cassandra situation has somewhat improved we're frequently firefighting okay so that is the case so they did do the data services they do the, they did they did do the request coalescing and all this on the cassandra and that the the screenshot confused me that's what that's what confused me because it says Scylla messages and i assume they moved to Scylla already by that time okay so that that's actually good so what are the remaining hot partitioning and latency are all of the remaining problems are all the garbage collection really that's it or let's take a look step one is easy we provision a new Scylla db cluster using our super disk storage topology by using local ssds for speed and leveraging rate to mirror our data to persistent disk we get the speed of attached local disk with the durability of a persistent disk with our cluster stood up we can begin migrating data into it okay so they built a brand new cluster with a completely different architecture than they had with cassandra maybe that helped a little bit with the io i suppose our first draft because it's still even with with request coalescing you're just what are you doing you're minimizing the number of requests i i wonder what will happen if they cache the data that they cache the messages or even at least the pages i don't know if the concept of pages exists and cassandra that better be it's the same concept as a database at the end of the day right and why not cache the problem i think clearly is like editing if you edit a message then you have to invalidate all that cash, right? And that's the big problem. And I think Twitter, I know a lot of people disagree with me. I think Twitter didn't implement the edit feature because they don't want to deal with in cache invalidation, to be honest. That's because they cache everything everywhere and an edit will really destroy them, you know? That's why they didn't add an edit feature. But I might be wrong. I don't know much about their architecture. Right. I know they edited like within the 30 minutes, and my guess is that in the first 30 minutes, they don't cache as much. I don't know. Our first draft of our migration was designed to get value quickly. We'd start using our shiny new cluster, uh, cut over, and then migrate historical data behind it. It adds more complexity, but wh what every large project needs is added complexity. Okay. We begin dual writing. Uh, that's if you even uh, when you do when you do migration you all have to do this dual writing right because now both clusters are alive every write to cassandra must go to a Scylla db so they wrote up i suppose some script that does that right duplicate the writes and in the back end they are also migrating the old data it requires a lot of you and once we get a setup we have an estimated it's gonna finish in three months to migrate everything it's a lot of time all right Here's what they did interesting. The time frame doesn't make us feel more and fuzzy inside. I love how they write this. It's a beautiful. And we prefer to get value faster. We sit down as a team and brainstorm ways we can speed things up until we remember that we've written a fast and performant database library that we could potentially extend. We elect to engage in some meme driven and greeny and rewrite everything in Rust. Oh, God. Oh, God. You and Rust. In an afternoon, we extended our data service library to perform large scale data migration. It reads token ranges from a database checkpoint, uh, checkpoints them locally via SQLite. Clever. So they, they write everything to, a, instead of writing it directly, write it everything to a lo local SQLite and then firehose that SQLite. I suppose you can compress and upload that sql light and then locally write sql light back to Scylla. that's a nice batching approach i love it right because now you see you save on on network i suppose right because there's when you insert you have to go through the network so what they cut in is like everything becomes local at one point you just you have all these rights and all of them millions of rights go to sql light 
you move the SQLite with one network I.O. They have a good bandwidth. And now they take that SQLite and then fire hose it. Brilliant, right? As opposed to sending millions of requests across the wire. Da, da, da. Insert, 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 insert. Right? We hook up our new improved migrator. Nine days. Wow. Three months. Three months to nine days. That's amazing, right? If we can migrate data this quickly, then we can forget our complicated time-based approach. Blah, blah, blah. We can flip. All right. So they, they turn this up. Now they're moving 3.2 million per second that is nuts right several days later they are gathered right they're looking at the 100 percent it's not really 100 percent 99.99999 why i'll give you the cliff note hits uh they hit a, a partition that is filled with tombstone tombstones and tombstones are deleted messages basically right anything that's deleted right is a tombstone and because as i told you in, in log structure mercury you never you never delete you never update you always insert so a delete is technically an insert with a tombstone so there's a you if you especially if you like delete a server or all the all their messages then you massively insert a bunch of tombstones and that's what they hit they hit a bunch of tombstones that they the the, the compaction will just die there right it was never compacted so they just like they stopped, compacted this, got rid of all the tomb, to, uh, tombstones, flipped over, done. In May 2022, it's been quite well behaved. They're happy. Everything is good. And uh, it's a much more efficient database. We're going from uh, running 177 Cassandra nodes down to 72 Scylla DB nodes. Of course, these Scylla DB nodes are larger in size compared to the 77, 177 Cassandra nodes, right? Now, Scylla has 9 terabyte compared to Cassandra, which has 4 terabyte nodes. Right? Nice. Our tail latency improved from 40 to 125 millisecond down to 15 millisecond from 125 to 15. That is so chill. That is so cool. And insert performance went from 5 millisecond to 70 down to a steady 5 it was it was it was the the even that wasn't as much this tells me that they did something with the disks the i they speed up they sped up their io themselves right you know what if they moved their ssds to zoned namespaces because this this is just a perfect implementation for them like just move everything to zone namespace this is the new nvme technology right so they don't have no they they they're gonna have more they don't have they they're not gonna have the uh what is it called the over provisioning they don't have over provisioning anymore they don't have garbage collection the zone namespace basically the zone is the erasable unit and it's it's gonna be controlled by the operating system so of course this has to be a huge rewrite right and the ss tables and all of these things will be just naturally goes into a zone right and then if they want to compact they just f flush the zone just erase the whole zone and then create a new zone so definitely moving to zone namespace will bring this number down to even lower than that right but they, they already did some tricks that sounds like it from there using local cached SSDs and stuff like that. So it's interesting that they're doing that. I wonder how much that will give them with uh, zone namespaces, especially with compacting and stuff like that, because it's just it's a perfect thing. And I think RocksDB with Western Digital, they did some experiments with zone namespaces, ZNS. And there is like a lot of stuff that I'm, I'm I'm trying to understand and learn about, but this is a this is a I think this is a good thing uh, if they if they consider that. And here I talk they talk about the final game, the word soccer, and says okay, this is our cluster. Like these these peaks are the goals, right? And all that stuff, and uh, they're happy, and they lived a, uh, 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 they lived uh, happily ever after. So. So it's a, it's, a, it's a fantastic, I absolutely love this blog. 
and I, as I read it multiple times, I, I'm learning. Um, as I read it again with you, I learned new things. Apparently, like every time you read it, and you learn new things. And uh, I, I, I take some of the messages and uh, and then some of the criticism I started back because they did everything they did. They, I don't. I think Chris Andro was not right for them anymore. And uh, the garbage collection is is kind of a deal breaker there. Uh, one thing is they did so much with so they they invested in Scylla, right? But they did so much other things to improve, right? They first added the data services, which didn't exist before. They played it with Cassandra and saw improvements, so that's a good thing. But they still saw hot partition. So what they did with Scylla, they we switched to Scylla. And they did that also the request coalescing with load balancing and hash based, uh, you know, request grouping. They also did this SSDs grouping thing, right? This is something I need to read more about because I have no idea what that means. Local SSDs for speed and leveraging rate to mirror our data to persistent disk, right? So they add local SSDs. That, does that indicate they didn't have local SSDs with Cassandra? maybe of course if you don't have local ssd with cassandra you're gonna you're gonna suffer and again guys i'm not defending cassandra i'm just questioning things here right? i wonder if they did this with cassandra they will be left with one problem right which is the uh, the garbage collection pauses that's the only problem left with cassandra as far as we know I know that CellaDB has certain compaction strategies that is, might not be available in in Cassandra, but how much really is the difference? That's what makes me think now. That's the I'll leave you with the final thought. That's one thing that they didn't try. And I'm not saying that they should have tried this or not. No. At the end of the day, this this is a better architecture, cleaner. Uh course if you can get rid of the garbage collection and it, it was causing you trouble get rid of it by all means but it's, it's interesting what they did to achieve this right we learned a lot from this blog i absolutely enjoy enjoyed reading it i absolutely enjoyed analyzing it i hope you did as well what do you think about this let me know in the comment section below and uh gonna see you in the next one and a uh, quick plug if you're interested in this stuff, check out my database course. I talk about databases and stuff like that. Uh, link redirects to Udemy, the Udemy course. It's around like 24 hours right now. Actual 24 hours worth of content. You know, I talk about all things databases, fundamentals, database engineering. So check it out if you're interested. Head to database.hussainnasr.com to learn more. Thank you so much. Can see you in the next one. Fantastic, fantastic article. Let's shout out the author again and everybody in the engineering team. Bo A. Graham and everybody in the Discord team. Fantastic engineering, brilliant engineering work. Uh, kudos. Great, fantastic, well written technical details. I don't have any complaints. I'm happy. I'm really happy with this blog. I enjoyed it. And uh, I'll see you in the next one. Thank you guys. Bye bye.